Coming up on Tech News Today, our annual iPhone scandal check-in. Whenever there's a new iPhone out, there's always one. Our data centers killing the Earth, and TiVo and Verizon make friends and plan to conquer the world. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, September 24th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Goto Assist by Citrix. Take control of your IT world from one simple cloud-based platform. Provide live or unattended support to all your users from anywhere. Sign up for your 30-day free trial today. Visit gotoassist.com and use promo code TNT. And by FreshBooks, the easy online invoicing app for small businesses that saves time and gets you paid faster. Join over 3.5 million FreshBooks users and try the service free for 30 days of unlimited use at FreshBooks.com. Be sure to let them know you heard about it on Tech News Today. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphone. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at Gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Owl. And this is the show where we try to keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feeds. <laughs> As with any iPhone launch weekend, we got reports of record sales and horrible insert controversy here, Gates. Apple says it sold <laughs> 5 million iPhone 5s over three days, which is either the best sales ever, which is true, or a disappointing shortfall of expectations, which is also true if you're an analyst. It just depends on who you ask. Among the controversies were the ever-stewing Apple Maps complaints, reports that retail stores got fewer iPhones to sell than Apple stores, and Scratchgate due to anodized aluminum cases. On a positive note, PCMag.com's benchmarks pegged the iPhone 5 as the fastest smartphone they've yet tested. Numerous reports of unrest at Foxconn's Taiyan plant has resulted in temporary closure. Around 2,000 workers allegedly took part, but the reasons range from spats between workers themselves from different provinces to an uprising against the plant's security. Foxconn released a statement indicating the riot did start as a personal disagreement between factory workers brought under control by police, but reports coming in from users of China's version of Twitter, Sina Weibo, claim security guards were beating one or more workers. Photos from the scene show destruction, broken windows, and a toppled guard post building. Access to Google and Gmail is now restricted in, in Iran. An advisor in Iran's, uh, to Iran's public prosecutor's office said the sites will be filtered until further notice. The version of Google that is accessible is unsecured, which means the government can snoop on its citizens easier. The latest ban is in response to an anti-Islamic film posted on YouTube. Samsung has begun rolling out Android 4.1, better known by some as Jelly Bean, to the Samsung Galaxy S3 handsets. Users in Poland reported the first update showed up, followed by Romania. The rollouts beat Samsung's promise to have the update come out in October. New Zealand Prime Minister John Key announced today he's requested an inquiry into illegal spying on Kim.com and other mega upload employees by New Zealand's Government Communications Security Bureau, Bureau, which is the country's counterpart to the U.S. National Security Agency. The two have been working together. This adds to the uncertainty on the ongoing efforts by New Zealand and the U.S. governments to extradite .com to the U.S. for further prosecution. A statement from the Prime Minister's office slated today, stated today, the Bureau had acquired communications in some instances without statutory authority. It almost sounds like they're going to extradite a TLD every time I hear that. TLDR. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on at Yahoo? Don't worry, All Things D has you covered with the latest leaked memo. Uh, coming up, CEO Marissa Meyer will hold three all-hands meetings in the next two weeks. Meyer also outlined her vision for the company on Friday. All Things D says that Yahoo is is doubling down on search and on advertising platforms. Also expect some redesigns at, at Yahoo Mail and Yahoo's homepage. Last week, Intel announced their first major phone partnership with Motorola, but one big missing feature was LTE support. TechCrunch has confirmed with Intel's director of product marketing, Sumit Sayal, that Intel will be shipping some LTE products later this year and ramping into 2013. So that particular barrier to U.S. entry may soon be removed. Sayal said Intel is also readying a dual-core med Medfield chip. Want to know how much the ThinkPad Tablet 2 running Windows 8 Pro will cost at launch? Yes. Mm -hmm. $7.99, mm -hmm. available October 26th, according to reps. 
people were happy to dole out that $7. information. $7.99. Well, all you had to do was ask. Seven ninety nine, yes, seven dollars ninety nine cents. That's a great deal. With times a hundred, oh. the price apparently includes a keyboard, which could make it a more attractively priced deal than Microsoft's own Surface Pro tablet, which may cost seven ninety nine, seven hundred ninety nine. That is Tom Merritt, mm -hmm. and an additional one hundred ninety nine dollars for its keyboard cover. Other specs: ten point one inch display, uh, a full version of Office twenty thirteen processor, rumored to be the Atom Clover Trail, running at one point eight gigahertz. Hey, West Coast. 3D printing fans, Whee! you now have your own store to crow about. Uh, in the wake of MakerBot's Manhattan storefront, Ars Technica reports D's Maker just opened a store at 290 North Hill Avenue in Pasadena, California, right near the old JPL. You'll be able to see the BukuBot in action in the store, and once the Kickstarter orders are fulfilled, you'll even be able to pick one up for 600 bucks. Netflix redesigned its Android app to be more in line with, with its iOS offering. The top row shows you videos you've been watching, and Netflix says you'll see a lot more information per screen. If you're impatient like me, you can just double tap a movie or TV show to start playing right away. Also, Netflix says search is available everywhere. The app works on Gingerbread and Hire and is available in the Google Play Store. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Citrix and Go to Assist. Believe me, you IT folks out there, you know it's challenging when your team's working from the same office. And, it's, and nobody stays in the same office. They all go running off to all four corners of the earth, and they expect you to figure everything out for them when something goes wrong. Uh, supporting members remotely is a real pain. That's why you need GoToAssist by Citrix. You can take control of your entire IT world from one simple cloud-based platform. That's right. You will stay in one seat while everybody else is flying all over the world, but you'll be able to support your users live or even unattended. If they're not at their computer, you can still get in, and you, you can you can travel too. You don't need to stay sitting in that seat because you can you can support them from your iPad. You can support them from your laptop. And with GoToAssist monitoring, you get customizable dashboards displaying performance of all networks, servers, and desktops, plus proactive alerting, which makes you look like a genius because you can fix small issues before they become big problems. Everybody just suddenly goes, you know, we just don't seem to have any problems anymore. Why is that? Makes you look like a hero. Go to Assist is easy to use, sets up in just minutes, and it's from Citrix, a trusted leader in IT. We use it right here at Twit uh, so that Leo doesn't have to get out of bed to reboot a server. It was a it was a good idea. We had we, and John too be able to. You don't have to run down to the studio, risk setting off the alarm, get in here and take care of the servers. You can do it right from bed. So go sign up for a special 30 day free trial today. Visit gotoassist.com, click on the try it free button, and use the promo code TNT. You don't have to take our word for it. Go try it for free right now. That's gotoassist.com promo code TNT, and we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right, joining us now to discuss the news of the day, I'd like to welcome in Mr. Jonathan Strickland of HowStuffWorks.com. How's it going, Jonathan? It's going well. How's it with you guys? It's doing. It's doing good. Your bandwidth has gotten better since the uh, since before the show. Slowly getting. Yeah, people watching this right now are thinking, "Wow, that's better." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This well, you is, certainly sound is, good. Believe it's me. an improvement of what it was. Yeah, the the uh, little bars on Skype went from red to yellow. Oh, good. Oh, yellow's yeah. good. Excellent. Yeah, yellow, uh, it's 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 teetering let's right not, on the edge. Let's not jinx yeah, it. Yellow's good. Er, it's good. It's our... too bad. See, if this were next week, I'd actually be in San Francisco. I could have, you know, know Skyped know. from there. <laughs> from, our, from across the room and used our bandwidth. <laughs> then it would be our own fault. Uh, let's get into the first story of the day. All kinds of Apple iPhone stuff to dig into. What are we going to talk about, Sarah? We're going to talk about Maps. Maps. Uh, I, I used Maps a lot this weekend. You know, I did too because I wanted to feel either the rage for myself that is an inferior product or be able to say, you know what, here's why it's not that bad and I actually sort of feel both ways. But we'll get into that in a second. Um, some, some interesting news for anybody who says, Google Maps should never have been stripped out of iOS X. I am mad as hell and I don't want to take it anymore. iOS engineer Ryan Petrick has posted a YouTube video which shows, and it's kind of a low quality video, uh, shows an -like iPhone 3GS running iOS 5, but also running... I'm sorry, iOS 6, but also running Google Maps, of course, not supposed to be possible. Um, he says the current build is buggy. It's not ready for, you know, public enjoyment just yet. But he seems to confirm he's prepping 
um, the Google Maps app for a public release on Iowa 6 would probably be released via Cydia. No actual date yet, but that's definitely bound to make some folks happy who say... He was a contractor? Is that what it was? And then and now he's on his own? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 he's sort of an engineer so slash hacker. So it's not like some hacker. rogue Apple employee that just... You no, know, yeah, no, yeah, no, no. If it wasn't on his own before, he, yeah, he would be now. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is sort of going rogue <laughs> right now. You could say that. Uh, but this is clearly going to make make you happy if you say, you know, I want Google Maps. Um, I don't like not having Google Maps, and and no matter what uh, Apple's product is. And you don't want to use the web version for whatever reason. Right, you right. Yeah. I know I wouldn't blame anybody, too, by the way. I tried to use Google Maps, just the mobile version via Safari, and Street View doesn't work, and they're just... It, it, I don't think it's like, well, just use it via Safari. It's exactly the same product. It's a very similar product it's as far as ideal. information goes, yeah. but it's not the same thing, and I wouldn't blame anybody for saying it's not good enough. Um, meanwhile, TechCrunch is reporting sources that say Apple is working pretty hard to get Maps experts who have worked on Google Maps to join the team in Cupertino. In fact, uh, someone from TechCrunch talked to a contractor, unnamed of course, who worked on Google Maps to integrate Street View and licensed third-party data to improve European coverage, as well as the platform's turn-by-turn -turn navigation there. And this person says, you know, when attention turned to indoor mapping, um, which it did, oh, I don't know, in the last year or so, maybe, maybe even a couple, a lot of people said, well, you know, my job has sort of turned into a maintenance job, an update, small incremental updates to a product that is, for the most part, pretty solid. And doesn't mean that it's not still a good job, but that can be... Um, it can be very attractive to say, wow, you know, I, I already I already worked on this product. It went really well. I feel like I know what I'm doing. And now I could have the opportunity to be in at more of a ground level on a product Maps, that still needs some work. And that would be Apple's Maps. It's, it's what, 10 years old or so? I mean, because yeah. I remember I was still working at Tech TV when it came out. And everybody was like, well, it's prettier than MapQuest. But I don't think it's better because it was having a lot of these same issues with root finding early, and everything. Early days, yes. Yeah, it's, it takes a while to perfect. But they've gotten close to that. Now, these, these unnamed sources aren't the only people saying, hey, Apple really wants to make maps better. Apple has job listings that specify uh, the need for people who have uh, uh, ability to, to make their maps product better um, with verbiage like to the, take it to the next level, vector-based map, Apple Maps, turn-by-turn -turn navigation, 3D. So that all sounds good. All that stuff is actually already part of the product, but clearly they want to make it better, which shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. But so over the weekends... I was like you, Tom. I was like, okay, well, let's put maps to the test. Let's see where it really fails. One of the things I'm doing is kind of doing my pie in the sky. Where will I travel next in the world? And one of my favorite things to do is uh, choose a place, find something on Airbnb that looks awesome, and then walk around that uh, area of town using Google Street View because it gives you a really good idea of like, does this look like a cool neighborhood? Does it look kind of shady? Are there a lot of stores and restaurants a lot around like that? With Apple Maps... You just don't have that anymore. So that's something that I have to go to a third party for, uh, which there are third party apps uh, on iOS that will pull from Google Street View data. So that's okay, but it doesn't really work as seamlessly. But one of the other things that people have uh, complained about a lot is stripping out transit information. Mm -hmm. So if you're not driving, you want transit information, you want to know what bu bus is next and that kind of thing, you don't have that within... Uh, Apple Maps, and it's true that you don't have that within the Maps app itself, but there is actually a pretty cool way that it integrates with other third-party apps that you might have downloaded. So if I look up, you know, a restaurant, it's like five miles away from my house, and I say I want directions to here, and then you go through uh, your Yelp information, which gives you some information mm -hmm. about the ratings of this restaurant and blah, 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 it will then kick you into apps that iOS is smart enough to say, oh, this is a transit app. Do you want to then open up these directions in that transit app? You mean like how it uh, opens up Google Maps on the web if you go from the Maps app Not to the really to like web that. link? Not really like that. Okay. No, Different. no, it's, <laughs> it makes a little bit more sense than that. That's a, that's an oversight that's probably going to be fixed at some <laughs> point. But uh, my, my point is, is uh, and, and if you don't have any transit maps, Apple then will say, here are some uh, but options in the app party. store. You have to use third parties, you which do. is not ideal. But what you're saying is at least it has something. Well, it's not ideal convenience-wise, but it might almost be more ideal if you happen to use a transit map app that you really like. Sure, I guess so. So in, the, in that sense, I kind of go like, yeah, okay, it's not, uh, this is not a fully baked product. I mean, that's a good example of that. 
but it doesn't mean that it's impossible to get good information. It's pretty easy. You just kind of have to know how to how to go through this. I used the turn by turn this weekend, which I th I found to be perfectly off awesome. Like it 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 hel helped me find my way to Yountville and back without any issues. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and I was listening to music, and then it would just kind of duck the music down and say, "Hey, turn left at 350 feet." Had no weirdness where it you know tried to make me take a turn that wasn't right or, or sent me in a weird direction. So. So far, so good as far as actually finding your way around. In fact, better than Google Maps, which the app on iOS didn't have turn by turn. Uh, however, the, the fact that when I use Google Maps a lot to find like nearby restaurants or see what businesses are around, Apple Maps was really disappointing in that. They have all the Yelp stuff, but it just didn't seem to have all the stuff that's around. Then maybe I'm the odd case because when I was using the Google Maps app in general, I found it to be just lackluster. I mean, it was great. You can see the street view things, but like when I would look for restaurants, it would always put me in the wrong area or it'd give me the wrong restaurants. And I'm, like, I'm talking about just browsing. Like, oh, yeah. I know I'm here, so I just look. Like pizza and near me or something. Like yeah. That didn't work so great. Oh, I always okay. ended up using the Yelp app for that. And like, because the Maps app didn't have turn-by-turn -turn directions, I had it. I, I eventually uh, bought a GPS app because I wanted something with turn-by-turn with, uh, -turn directions. So, I mean, it had some really cool functions when I was sitting there and I had a connection and I wasn't moving. But for Maps in general, I wasn't using it like on a day-to-day -day basis. I use my GPS app much more often than I use the, the the new turn by turn because I kind of forget it's there. It just got added what last week, so I I, haven't, I didn't use the iOS six beta or anything like that. And then when it comes to Street View, like I think that's nice when you're just kind of sitting around. But if, when I'm doing that, I can do that on my laptop. So I guess I'm just really used to using it that way. So my use case seems to be completely different than everybody else who's just like, oh, the map maps app is awful. It's like I don't use it for much. Other than like the well, you're just saying you never used it in the first place very much. It just so. I didn't think it was that good to start with. And yeah. The fact that people are like, oh well, it's not as good as the old one. I'm like, the old one wasn't that good either. I think a lot of yeah has to just do with how often are you really using a Maps app at all? I mean, for me, I use it. I use it a lot. I, I, oh, I'm a shut in. I don't yeah. think I don't think well I don't think I use the Maps app on a daily basis. I probably I a couple times a week when I'm traveling. Clearly, all the time, but I'm not always traveling. So I'd say I use it every day. Yeah. yeah. Practically, yeah. What about you, John? Uh, I use, well, first of all, I'm an Android user, so ha ha! Um, my Google Maps is awesome, and I love it, and it's been great the whole time. Uh, but my wife just got an iPhone 5, so for the first time in ever, we used her phone to do a Maps uh, thing just this weekend, actually. We were going to a place we had never been before. We needed the Maps app to, to send us there. And she said, you know what? We're going to use this. I want to see if any of these complaints hold any water or if, if this is all going to be fine. Uh, we still have your phone. So if we do end up finding ourselves passing through the Shire on our way to Real Yay <laughs> before all of Armageddon comes down upon us, we can turn on yours and we can get out. Uh, but everything worked fine. <laughs> Um, it did send us in a f fairly roundabout way to get from one location to another, but it may just very well have been that that was the most efficient way because Atlanta is not laid out in any way that makes sense to mortal kind. Um, but yeah, we we seem to it seemed to work just fine for us, and it was giving us more or less the same directions. Uh, as my phone would, because I went ahead and pulled it up on mine and looked at the list of directions. And with a couple of minor exceptions, it was taking us through the same sort of routes. Uh, we do use it fairly frequently because we travel quite a bit. And uh, also we have lots of friends scattered throughout all of Atlanta and we only occasionally get a chance to visit them. So we never remember the right way to get there. Uh, so yeah, the maps thing is, is sort of pivotal, at least the way I use my smartphone. So, um, so far I don't really complain about it. And also I like to think that when, uh, when Siri came out, you know, there was that initial excitement and then there was some disappointment as it didn't seem to live up to everyone's expectations. There were a lot of people saying that it wasn't as good as they thought it was going to be or that it was actually getting worse over time. And then recently I've been hearing more and more people say, no, no, it's, it's really improved. I'm thinking that maybe Maps is probably going to go through that same process where there's going to be this initial period where all the bugs are going to start coming out and we're going to realize where the shortfalls are. But Apple's going to make up for that pretty quickly. I, I agree. Uh, the only thing that confuses me is why Apple felt it was necessary to get into this business. Yes, it's going to take a while to perfect this. Google Maps was not that great at the beginning, and it's not perfect yet either. It's always it's still building. Uh, companies like Nav Tech have been around forever. Uh, Nokia owns them now. They make good maps. I know TomTom is providing the data to Apple, but why would Apple feel they had to do this themselves? 
if it weren't for the fact that they were in a spat with Google? Is I is, think I still don't know. There's the possibility that there's location-based advertising that's going to tie into this somehow. That sure. that would be my first guess. Yeah, they're probably I mean, making money, a little money off Yelp money. already. Yeah. Good so point. that's that's exactly. I mean, and and really, I think there's a huge future in that. I mean. Uh, but Apple, the, the, the line is always Apple makes money off hardware, not software. So while that makes sense, it that would doesn't be mean that Apple different. doesn't want to make money off hardware and software down the road. But well, they're not going to go start YouTube. They're you know a video uh, service to compete with the YouTube app that's gone. I mean, I guess Maps is just so integral to the function of a phone these days. Yeah, mobile, that, pretty yeah. important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's move on to Verizon and TiVo making peace and partnering up. Yeah, it's a stop get, fighting and get a room. What, a, a cross licensing agreement and a patent dispute. I I didn't see this coming at all. Verizon's going to pay TiVo two hundred and fifty million dollars to settle pa uh, settle a patent dispute. Uh, the dispute was over FiOS DVR going up against TiVo's DVR patents, which obviously TiVo uh, had had some legs to stand on there. TiVo also has a deal with Dish, uh, so they've they've had some victories in the past. Uh, part of the Verizon deal, though, the cross-licensing agreement, and it looks like the two companies are working together in the future when it comes to Verizon streaming service with Redbox potentially being on TiVo's in the future. Uh, last quarter, subscriber base for TiVo was up 41%. That's a lot more subscribers than before, but they had a net loss of $27 million. The thing is, you know, increased subscriptions are a great sign for TiVo. I mean, that means they have more users, and settlements help keep it afloat for a bit because, you know, they've had a bunch of, of, of patent wins. But what's it going to take for TiVo to be a big player in the DVR world at this point? Do they need partnerships, or is it just too far too late because all these cable companies have their own DVRs? That's a really good question. I, I don't know I, I don't know how TiVo is still around. So I, I, that kind of gives me hope for them is that they've figured it up till now how, how to do this. And then uh, I, I guess, yeah, if they can if they can get Verizon to integrate them if they could get comcast to integrate them but honestly i think tivo's best bet is to partner up with somebody to provide the interface for the box that one box that does everything that apple is supposedly after that nintendo is is going to be including in the wii u uh, that would seem to be the smartest way to go for them although i don't know that they're not seen now as kind of old-fashioned i don't even know anybody who uses a tivo I, and I'm not saying it's because yeah, people not, don't, right. because clearly they, they do. But not it's not only that. I, I know people who used to use TiVos, love TiVos. But it's like there are just other DVR options now, and TiVo just isn't the only game in town. And I don't talk, I don't hear people talking about TiVo, and certainly not signing up to get a TiVo because it's so exciting, because now with TiVo I can do stuff that I didn't used to do. We're all kind of used to the options that we have. I definitely know a few people who have TiVo, and they rave about it. They're like, no, TiVo is still great, but it's starting to sound a little like opera fans, mm -hmm. where mm. it's there are fewer and fewer of them, and they're getting more and more strident about how awesome their box is, and you just don't know because you don't use it. And I, and I don't want to disagree. I, I, I think TiVo is still very good and probably the best DVR interface. But are DVRs the way forward? And if not, what's the way forward for TiVo? John, do you have a thought on that? Uh, I agree with you. I think that the best measure for TiVo right now is to really look at partnering with someone else. And as far as the future of DVRs go, that I... I can't really comment on it too much. I just, it's a it's a game that's got a lot of players in it, and I don't know how long it's going to last. Are you building a DVR? No, I <laughs> I, I work for a company that's there, a Yeah, you work for an entertainment <laughs> company. I get it. I just liked the idea that John was secretly building the next big DVR. Just, just blow in the his frame. Basement. You can see. I can't talk about it. Yes, <laughs> my Raspberry Pi came in the mail yesterday. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, well, let, let's talk about Marissa Meyer and her Yahoo strategy then. Uh, we mentioned in the news, Fuse, that, she, uh, that she's going to have an all-hands meeting at Yahoo tomorrow. She's been talking with the board. She's going to outline plans to turn the company around. She's done that with the board. Now she's going to bring in the staff. A couple of meetings, actually, one for international folks, one for domestic folks. Uh, the leaks keep coming, even though Ron Bell, the chief legal counsel for Yahoo, uh, made a vicious internal memo that was leaked about not leaking memos. Huh. Uh, but... The, there will also be another all-hands meeting on October 1st where she'll begin rolling out a new system and process for goals for the company. I want to lay out what they think is going to happen in this meeting and, and get your opinion on, on how well you think this is going to go for Yahoo and where you think they're going to go with it. Uh, focusing on search, advertising, email, and the Yahoo homepage. Focusing on the consumer experience with all of those. Removing ads, 
uh, from email. They've already done that in a couple cases, removing ads from the homepage to make it easier to use and making Yahoo more of a platform than a portal. Uh, in fact, one of the, the quotes in the All Things D article from Kara Swisher uh, described it as being a little more Facebook-like, emphasizing social aspects of things. Sarah, is this, you know, host of the social hour, is this uh, the right direction for Yahoo to tech? Yeah, so I just went to yahoo.com as as you were uh, laying out some of, some of the initiatives and a giant, big, animated pop-up uh, for a sitcom on CBS. <laughs> I mean, that <laughs> one. The screen. There it is. And yeah, there you go. Ah! Exactly. That just happened to me not the five seconds ago. Ad, yeah. That's yeah, a really bad that. first impression. Oh, I hate this. That's the, that's the sort of thing that makes me not go to websites. Yeah. This happens all the time in tech websites that we use to source information for this show, which I just don't complain about because we, we need them. But do I need to go to Yahoo if that's the sort of experience that I'm getting? That's terrible. They should get rid of that. Now, of course, you say, well, Google advertises in emails. We see advertisements. Yes, that's true. But uh, they can probably figure out how to be not only a little bit more cleaner and non-invasive, but cut down on some of this stuff. Uh, you know, there's, there's a whole... When you, when you look at Yahoo, I, mean, I still feel like the whole Yahoo thing with the cutesy purple and the exclamation point is... It's it's just they they need an image rebranding. It's ripe for that. You're right. Yeah, and I mean it's not as if because Yahoo's a silly name because so is Google. Yeah, it's just a matter of getting things to look a little bit more grown up. And Get, that's, taking the focus back to search, like when I go to Yahoo, the first thing I think of is not search because there's so much stuff crowding the image that I get confused if I ever go there, you know? Well, it's like, why does so he come here? So much stuff, but then what? what is it? What is that stuff? I think that's the biggest problem for yeah, me. Yeah, absolutely. It's, like, it's, not just, it's not just about the, the fact that it's dis distracting from search, but there seems to be some news up there, yeah, and movies. then a bunch of things on the left that's kind of a big menu that all flows together, oh, and I don't really scopes, understand. Okay. I don't <laughs> have time to read it. You know, that's kind of the, the, the whole thing point that Yahoo was making for a long time was that they were, you know, a content company, not so much a search company. They had search as well, but they were becoming a platform for content. Uh, most of the stuff that that have, that was laid out in this memo doesn't really surprise me because it's exactly what you would expect. It's, they're going to focus on search. They're going to focus on uh, email. Uh, you know, it's all the stuff you think of when you think of Yahoo. They're going to concentrate on the homepage. The biggest change that I can see is this idea of the platform where it becomes much more modular is what it sounds like to me. And it'll be based upon what people want to appear in their Yahoo page, as opposed to a universal approach that you would get if you logged in from, you know, whichever device you happen to have. Um, but there weren't a lot of surprises here. I mean, it's, when I was looking at the memo, I was thinking, yeah, that makes sense. There's nothing that's that's jumping out at me as this is a brand new, very bold move. Uh, that doesn't mean that the initiatives where they actually do change these things aren't bold. They might very well be. But right now, I'm still just, my optimism is still at cautious level. And you know, his homepage reminds me of like MSN. Back when Microsoft did MSN search, you'd have all this stuff everywhere. And then Microsoft did something smart by breaking it out. You can still go to msn.com or go to Bing. I mean, if you try to type in MSN search, it doesn't actually work anymore. So the idea that, that Yahoo could split it off a bit, I think it'd be quite beneficial to them. But what Yahoo can do, I mean, it's kind of, I'm just kind of intrigued by what they're going to do with search because obviously Bing powers their search results. So what kind of results are we going to see and how are they going to be presented? Because they've, they've had some pretty interesting ways to show things with the, their Access browser. When they showed that off, the way they were showing results were these these tiled images instead of seeing the normal what is the, the old saying the 10 blue links right, right. google's moved away from that they have that knowledge graph and bing has has all its social functions what yahoo could do at this point i'm just kind of intrigued if they're really going to try to move forward we could see something really just a totally different interface for search because they have to do that because why else would you go to yahoo over bing if the search results are the same unless it's presentation. Yeah. Focus on on the things that are really powerful for you. Search is actually powerful for them, even though, like you, Jason, I think a lot of people forget that Yahoo does it. But Flickr, 
I think a lot of people forget Yahoo does Flickr. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Flickr is still used. It's still popular. And, and if they're not careful, it'll, it'll get tromped because people are thinking about Instagrams and, and other types of photo sharing services. So bring that back to the fore. I think it'll, it'll be interesting to see what Marissa Meyer comes up with. But it does, like John, I think you're right. She's, she's pointed in the right direction if, if this is the right direction that they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Let's take a quick break and uh, thank our other sponsor for today's show, Fresh Books. If you're in business for yourself, uh, there's one thing you love, and that's getting paid. And there's another thing you hate, and that's filing the paperwork and the invoices that you need to do to get paid. You only put up with it, right, because you know you're going to get paid in the end. Well, what if you could make that invoicing easy so that it wasn't frustrating and you still get paid? In fact, you might get paid faster. Try FreshBooks.com. It's what I use for all of my invoicing. Uh, with Sword and Laser LLC, uh, and it makes it so much faster, so much easier. You can have the invoices emailed. They'll actually have, you can send them through the mail as well if you want to set it up that way. And you got all your accounting in the cloud. Uh, create invoices easily, email them to your clients, view the invoices online. They can pay you through the internet as well, through FreshBooks with a credit card. Uh, you can turn timesheets into invoices, run all kinds of great reports to monitor your small business. And you can use a FreshBooks iPhone app to track your uh, invoices and your customers when you're away from the office. FreshBooks lets you try their service for free, too. So you don't have to take my word for it. Go sign up right now. You'll get 30 days of unlimited use, all the features, clients, staff, everything, no limits, just by signing up at FreshBooks.com. It would be nice if you tell them during the sign-up that you heard about it from Tech News Today. They'll ask you where you heard about FreshBooks. Helps us show that... You know, their, their support is worth it. Uh, so sign up right now. 30 days of unlimited usage, all the features, everything. Join 3.5 million FreshBooks users, including myself, who have been sending and paying invoices at FreshBooks.com for free. Try it out, FreshBooks.com. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Onward into the rumor mill. Uh, we, I guess we should have turned this into a rumor mill, but it looks like uh, as the Amazon Kindle disappears from more and more stores, there's rumors Amazon might start a store. Oh, Again, another one of these rumors. Oh, look at right that. <laughs> nicely, nicely done, Jason. You know. Mill. Rumor mill, yes. The speculation is... Johnny on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Running rampant because last week Walmart said it's not selling the Kindle or the Kindle Fire anymore. Target dumped the Kindle a while ago. Uh, Walmart, though, is not afraid of tablets. It's apparently just about Amazon because it's still selling iPad, Nook, the Nexus 7, so pretty much everything but, except the Kindle Fire. Uh, Kindle's still available, though, in a bunch of stores, Best Buy, Office Depot, Radio Shack, Staples. Uh, there's an analyst at Forrester Research saying that the Kindle is a bit of a Trojan horse. I like this. And retailers should have dumped the Kindle a while ago. And Amazon's actually tested out a couple of stores before selling goods. So I'm just going to go around. Would it be advantageous for Amazon to open a retail store to sell a Kindle Fire? We'll throw it to Jonathan. That's a good question. Um, I mean, there is something that's valuable about being able to go someplace and get a physical product in your hands before you commit to buying one, uh, especially if there are a lot of other ones that are available out there to see. Uh, not everyone has moved to the same sort of uh, buying habits that I have where I hide in my dark room and log online and buy everything to have it sent to me. Some people actually emerge from the house occasionally. So I think for those people, this is this is a valuable uh, uh, it would be a it would be a value to them. It'd be a value to Amazon. I actually went back and forth on this a lot when I was thinking about it because you know, anecdotally, if I go from my own experience, it seems like a complete waste of time, resources, and money because I would I, I so rarely go out shopping and looking at physical things. But then I think about normal people who don't have <laughs> crippling social anxiety and go outside. Um, actually, I don't either. But <laughs> but but for them, I think it is a very valuable uh, resource, and it makes sense for Amazon to go into this because uh, you know it is kind of the gateway drug into going into my lifestyle where the well-adjusted social creatures can join me and never leave the house and buy everything online. So uh, if they're not going to be able to do that by putting these products side by side in various retail establishments because they've, they no longer will carry them, obviously the next step is to build your own. I think um, 
we always talk about how you go into a retail store, you see something, you go, okay, okay, I like it. Now I'm going to go home and buy it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So for all of the people who do that, there's a whole nother subset of people who just buy the thing that they like because there they are and they're touching it and they're in the store and there's a bit of that impulse thing going on. So there's that in-store impulse buy that people have kind of the same way that you have impulse buys on Amazon. And if Amazon can make it so they're the store that you either buy it when you're there that day or you buy it later online. doesn't really matter because you're still buying from Amazon. That makes sense to me. Every time this uh, comes up, uh, and it's come up a couple of times, uh, the, the first thing you, you hear from people is, well, they'll have to pay tax. And the thing is, Amazon is, is negotiating that already. So that obstacle is moving out of the way. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're negotiating a ta tax deal uh, and helping to push for legislation that, that would allow them uh, to pay, pay taxes, but not at, at such a rate that, that they feel it is punitive to their business. So let's set that aside, because it sounds like that might get solved, in which case it doesn't make sense for Amazon to move into space. There's all these empty borders stores and all these big box chains going out of business. Would, could Amazon move in and like do a working warehouse where you could do, I feel like there's all kinds of cool things they could do. They could have a demonstration area where you could see their products in action. They could have a pickup area where you could just, you know, like, hey, I'll pick it up on my way home from work in case you don't have a good delivery system at home. Like I've lived in apartments where it, I didn't want stuff shipped there because it was just I such don't a pain. I don't want anything shipped to my house. Exactly. I'm never home. So I, wait, I think wait. there's a lot of advantages there, but yes, John. They, they could they could also have a ride section where you could ride one of those robots that goes around their warehouses yes. and picks up all the shelves. That would be awesome. I'd An, do that. A muson month park. Uh, no, oh I, I take that back. But I, I just I just don't see them doing it yet. I just don't see them doing it. Maybe I maybe what this could be is the idea of them. Uh, saying let's do some kiosks or maybe some pop-up stores like mm -hmm. Microsoft is doing to get Kindles into people's hands and kind of get them to go home and order it on Amazon. That's lower cost and, and fits into what you're what saying, What about people Sarah? who've got these exclusive Amazon book deals? You could have book tours and... An event space. Event spaces. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's Musicians. all sorts of stuff that, yeah, yeah. that, that Amazon um, could do to not only get people in the stores and, and, and possibly buying products, but just... Thinking of Amazon as this sort of living, breathing, we do a lot of stuff uh, for their consumers and community. I don't see Amazon jumping into like to all these empty borders stores. I think what they probably would likely do is go with mini stores inside of stores, like like what Apple has in Best Buys. Apple has its own retail stores, but they really control the experience within a Best Buy, which is that little mini store that Amazon could have and always powered. This is one thing that happens. Like but it staples. seems like the retail stores are kicking them out instead of welcoming them in to do that. If they can come up with a strategic partnership with Best Buy or something, or like, oh, mm. it comes preload with Rhapsody, which Best Buy used to own, or that, I forget what exactly that turned into. But I think it was Napster, and whatever. But the thing is, if they come up with a way to get that content onto that Amazon Kindle Fire, mm. and they say, look, we'll give you a cut. Now, that's going to be a big thing, but they don't have to set up uh, retail stores and, and leases and all this other stuff that Amazon doesn't traditionally do. But if you have those... The always on device versus you go to a Staples and that Kindle's not working. You're not going to buy that device that's just like the dummy unit. You want to make sure this thing is working all the time. And you have an educated staff that can explain it. If they have a mini store and a Best Buy, I think that might be the way to go. All right, let's. Uh, we got some social stories. We've got a social roundup, cowboy. Yeah, cowboy that's, Sarah Lane. That, woo -hoo. Yeah, one of the social stories makes me happy, and one of the social stories makes me sad, mm. or actually kind of scared. Should we guess is which it more one is which? accurate? Right. Yeah, I'll explain both of them to you, All and right. then you can tell me which one you think I like and I like which one game. I don't. It's like the, new uh, the first one: Twitter's going to allow us all to download download all of our old tweets from our very first tweet. That's frightening. That makes you very sad because you don't want to know what you did three years ago. Okay, now compare that to the idea that Facebook will now allow you to view and or delete all or part of your search history. That's good. Is it I want to delete though? it. Well, yeah, you do. But okay, so here... Here's why we uh, yeah, it's the opposite, lines. didn't we? Yeah, it's <laughs> opposite. Somebody's got a case of the Mondays. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about what's going on here. Dick Costolo, who of course is CEO of Twitter, spoke at the Online News Association conference on Friday and said tweets will be available to download before the end of this year. I assume that means 2012. Now he said 
this was something that they were working on back in July. He has since said, yeah, it's going to be by the end of the year because someone said, you said that you were working on this. When are we going to get this functionality? So, you know, in the next few months, um, he also spent some time defending some of Twitter's recent API changes and said, listen, Twitter has to take steps after we realize that companies are making money off of our service without adding accretive value. That was his words. Ac oh, uh, oh, like like a creative. Like uh, from the word accreting. I get it. Yes. I get what he's saying. Okay. Um, he also outlined a new tool that Twitter would be releasing, talked about it, didn't show it, uh, that would allow third-party apps to aggregate and publish groups of tweets. So something that was written in connection to a particular news event, for example. So it's kind of Twitter saying, listen, people are kind of upset with us right now. <laughs> we but we're it. working on tools that are going to help third-party developers make the most of Twitter. We're not about locking down the ecosystem so nobody can build cool things off of our project. We just don't want alternative Twitter universes that mimic what we do. We want you to create something based on Twitter that does something different. Not a huge surprise. So you kind of go, It's a different right. philosophy. It's a philosophy change. Exactly. That's, that's exactly right. Um, I think that the whole downloading tweets thing, I mean, how important is that really? It's not that important to me, but it's something that I would do. I'd probably look look through it on a rainy day, like, hey, what did I say in you know March of 2007? What was my 10th tweet ever kind of yeah, thing? Because yeah. I don't remember what that was. Now, here's why the whole Facebook Apparently history thing. your first thing, tweet was about wine, according to someone in the chat room. Yes, that's right. I was <laughs> drinking cheap wine in Buenos Aires. That's exactly what my first tweet was. Um, it was very exciting. So, Facebook, here's why this scares me. Facebook is now allowing you, this is something that they're rolling out over the next couple of weeks, by the way, and I don't have this functionality yet, or I would show you, is now allowing folks to view and or delete all of your search history or just selective parts of your search history, what you would do is you'd go into your own account and then uh, on your on your own page, you've got an activity log section. Now, uh, in the activity log section, if you click into that, so I'll go ahead and click into it. In the upper right-hand corner, you've got a little drop-down menu that says all. And right now, you've got options to look at your posts, look at posts by others, stuff that you've liked, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in the next few weeks, if you don't already have the functionality, you will now see a search area. Now, in the search area, you can basically see what you have searched for. The reason that this bothers me, and Tom, I agree with you, it's it's a good idea, I guess, for me to be able to, to, have control to blow out that search. But this is not anything that anyone else is supposed to be able to see. The only time anyone else would see this is if for some reason they get access to your account. And now all of a sudden they have access to your search history. And that is what I don't like. Because right now, even if they got access to your account, they have access to a lot of things, but not search. Mm. Because it wasn't even an option until right the second. So that freaks me out. Especially if there are certain selective things that... I don't know, you wouldn't want a particular person to know about. Now, all of a sudden, if you're not on top of it on a regular basis, because this is something that has to be done manually, now you're possibly more vulnerable. If you got hacked. Yeah. If someone got into your yes. account somehow. Yeah. Yes. Security-wise, I feel like it's like, eh, I mean... I would rather have the... I guess if I... That's a Hobson's choice in a way, but... Given the given the choice, I would rather have the ability to be able to go in and delete stuff and and just worry about securing my account as the big danger mm -hmm. than not have the ability and not have it in there. But that's it, it's 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 an interesting question. So, but okay, so but again, my question: if no one else can see any of this, what do you care if your account is secure? Well, no one else can see it in your account, but Facebook can see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Facebook's yep. got that history. I want to be able to delete that from them, not just from the public or anyone else. John, you were saying, yeah. Yeah, no, that was the same thing I was thinking of, was that that if this ability was not in your account, if they did not roll this out, then you would not be able to go in and delete stuff from your search uh, history that would be still living at Facebook. And then... Who, you know, there are things that could happen where that search history could be made public anyway. Even if you are really good about keeping all of your uh, information secure, there's always the chance that, you know, either it's some someone at Facebook who gets upset and decides, you know what, I'm going to go out in a blaze of glory and I'm going to publish all this, this private information somewhere or if somehow they get hacked. I mean, there are a lot of different ways that this information could be revealed. This, I think, is good in that it gives you the opportunity to go in and say, 
you know, I really don't want that showing up in my search uh, history for whatever reason. I'm going to delete that and know that it's gone not just from your machine, which is a problem, but from Facebook's machines as well. All right. Uh, I asked you got anything? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually more excited about the Twitter being to yeah. download your tweets. Yeah, your tweets. I want to be able to, like, leave Twitter. That's one of the things I can't do because I can get I can f go further back to a certain point, and I know that there's services out there that kind of do this, but you can't get the full archive. Mm -hmm. And if you're really sick of what Twitter's doing with their with their API changes, and you want to be able to move entirely, like you can do this with blogs all the time, but the the ability to leave Twitter and go, oh yeah, by the way, that's archived. I got this data it, portability, and I can move. But that's yeah. what I'm excited about. And, and get it direct from Twitter, right? I mean, it's great. There's companies like Smarterware with ThinkUp mm -hmm. uh, that do this sort of stuff for sure. But but Twitter being able to provide it directly is 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 easier. Let's finish up uh, with New York Times story yesterday on Sunday. James Glantz took a uh, a long article, a year long look at data centers' power usage. Uh, claiming that data centers waste 90% of the energy they consume. They emit diesel exhaust from generators. Several have been cited uh, for environmental violations because of those diesel generators. Nationwide data centers use about 76 billion kilowatt hours, uh, at least in 2010 they did, or roughly 2% of all the electricity used in the United States that year. And uh, he discussed overbuilding, uh, underutilization, the, the, the amount of power that goes into keeping a server ready just in case someone needs the data that happens to be on that server, even though it's not accessed most of the time. Uh, Apple and Google were briefly noted for their green approaches to data centers, uh, but more extensive was, was talking about the waste of energy, uh, the 24 clean air violations by Amazon for their diesel generators. And this got a lot of criticism from people in the data center business as, and elsewhere. Uh, Forbes' Dan Woods wrote a very good critique of this, saying, look, this confuses the Internet and IT. He makes it sound like you wanting to check your Yahoo Fantasy score is wasting a bunch of energy when most of the examples he cites, uh, for instance, he, he cited a, an example for a, a data center that was an IT data center. Uh, he's like, this is, this is IT data centers that he's talking about, not usually web servers. He doesn't talk about VMware or other virtualization. Uh, he mentions one power-saving company that didn't get any clients, but he doesn't talk about the ones who have gotten clients to get more efficient data center uses, uh, companies like 1E or PowerAssure. He doesn't talk about the Facebook Open Computer Green Data Center Initiative. Uh, Tim Carmody at The Verge was another a uh, crit critic of this, He's, and uh, here's a quote from Tim. It's only when we recognize that the Internet isn't a pointless distraction, but is becoming as fundamental to our lives as roads, plumbing, and petroleum that we understand why data usage and energy costs continue to grow and grow. And he was criticizing for not putting into context why this is growing, but making it sound like, well, we want to check our Yahoo Fantasy Sports score at what cost it's killing the Earth. Jonathan, did you get a chance to to read through this? I'm, I'm curious, you know, you work with how stuff works and explaining how this stuff works. Uh, maybe you guys have an article on data centers out there that could be helpful. I, I'm interested in your perspective. Uh, sure. We've done <clears throat> episodes of tech stuff about data centers, and we've done uh, some articles on the subject. This is far more complex. I mean, the New York Times uh, piece that that kind of started this whole discussion was was fairly extensive, but even that didn't even scratch the surface of how complex this issue is. Uh, for one thing, there, there's this thought of all these different servers that are lying dormant. A lot of those server, servers are there for redundancy. They are holding bits of information that are being held by other servers that might be used frequently, but if that server goes down and you still need the information, it has to be somewhere else. So companies like Google are famous for using lots of relatively inexpensive machines so that they can have uh, as many of them as possible to hold all this data while still having plenty to expand, you know, in the future. And this whole expansion thing is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Uh, the light latest figures I saw for, let's say, uh, YouTube uh, is that uh, for every minute that goes by, 72 hours of video footage are being uploaded to YouTube. Well, that's an incredible amount of data that needs to be stored somewhere. So there's a demand that needs to be met. And if it's not being met, then the system breaks. So our dependence on the system is sort of dictating this, this uh, growth rate. Our need for redundancy requires that there need there have to be more machines online than, th than you actually are using. Uh, there's also a good point I saw in one of the critiques, which was that while one of the, the major criticisms leveled against data centers was that most of these machines are at a very low utilization. 
the author does not suggest what level of util utilization would actually be appropriate. And without having a, uh, having a number that you need to hit, it's hard to say, well, this other company is not doing the right job because their, their machines are all running at 10% capacity or lower. Um, it also doesn't go into how technology is improving efficiency, even on the chip level. I mean, you've got companies that are constantly upgrading the chip microarchitecture so that they use less power to do the same amount of work or more, greater amount of work than current chips. So uh, there were a lot of problems with this. Uh, the, the bit about Google, they talked about how much energy Google uses but did not actually break that out into, all right, well, what percentage of that is coming from things like hydroelectric power as opposed to pulling uh, power off the grid? Without knowing that, you can't really criticize Google for its energy usage. You need more information. And I think that was the biggest issue I had with all of this was that it was almost like a scare tactic. And without, without the full story, you really can't draw a conclusion the way that the story seemed to. Yeah, I, I think that was a, the problem is that this is a good issue to raise. I think a lot of people in the data center industry would agree that, that power usage and energy efficiency is important, but this article didn't treat it uh, with the right data. Uh, it didn't identify the, the right problems. It made it sound like uh, we're all just, you know, using this Internet thing, which is frivolous and wasting a lot of data on it. Uh, when in fact, it's it, as Tim Carmody pointed out, it's very important. Uh, and, and there were some exaggerations in there. The diesel uh, usage isn't constant. It's only used as a backup. And of course, the diesel generators get tested. Uh, regularly to make sure they're still in working order. And that's where the, the violations came from. Uh, these folks at Amazon didn't properly file a license to run that diesel generator. It wasn't like they were belching smoke 24-7. Bad thing not to file that that environmental uh, uh, paperwork, for sure. And that needs to happen. But that's far from the main issue with data center usage. And it, there was not enough talk about the kinds of things that are being done and can't or could be done uh, to, to solve this. So, yeah, I, I feel like a, a lack of an emphasis on solutions was missing here and, and a lack of overall knowledge of what's really being done in the industry. Like you said, Google has solar powered data centers as well. So does Apple. Uh, Apple's been working on putting that in as well. So kind of the right impulse with the article, but but not very well done. And and maybe that's OK because it is the Internet and we have so many people responding with the right facts out there in the end. Maybe it ends up being useful. Uh, it just wasn't useful on its own. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. So for 30 bucks, I can control my computer with my eyes. That's right. A couple, 30 bucks. That's all it takes. Uh, there's a, a researcher put together at, at the college in London, Imperial College in London, a new device that costs $30. Originally, it was going to cost $64. That lets you track or move a mouse with your eyes. Uh, it's, 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 it's insane because the fact is it was supposed to be $64 and then the technology changed, so it's under $30. I uh, can track eye movements uh, pretty accurately. And the thing is they're even talking about how to use this to move a wheelchair. Uh, the idea of the trigger would be that you would wink and that way you could determine where the wheelchair is going to move instead of accidentally blinking and doing that. So it allows you to look around and do all kinds of things. And there's obviously a lot of uh, sillier things like, oh, it can control my drapes. This is the odd, odd things that you could do. But 30 bucks. That's crazy. This is getting closer and closer to reality. This idea that uh, our, our, I would wager in five years, our input interfaces are going to wildly change. You know, even looking at, at that, at the actual device, the image of it, it's really not that bulky considering. I mean, it's two cameras <laughs> like sitting on your glasses. So it's a little silly looking little right now. Yeah. But I mean, this is, this is the one that actually works. So that, right. that's, that's impressive. It's really small. And I, I know as, as, a, as a user of a computer with multiple windows up, I constantly am using keyboard shortcuts for the wrong thing. So this is my very frivolous use of this. I would love for it to track my eyes and go, hey, oh, by the way, I'm looking at chat. I'm not looking Eve at- Eve Bahar should get a hold of this and then it'll all be good. <sighs> I, 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 okay. <laughs> go. Interesting. Uh, however, I've seen, I've seen lots of eye tracking software paired with, you know, pretty basic webcam hardware that, seems to do very much the same sort of stuff. I mean, even to the point where you're playing games where like it was like a game that was similar to, Asteroid. to Asteroids. Yeah, where you'd stare at, at, at an asteroid and make it explode by staring at it. You had to track it with your eyes so that you could yeah, yeah. Uh, target the right one. So, I mean, I'm seeing stuff like this where it doesn't require you to wear any sort of head-mounted uh, device 
And I think uh, apart from the the applications where you're talking about things like controlling a, a wheelchair, where obviously that that sort of implementation is much different and very valuable, uh, I think uh, it makes way more sense to go with the camera software approach for basically controlling a computer. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Gazelle.com. I've got my old iPhone in a Gazelle box right now. I'm going to drop it off at the U.S. Post Office because I got my new phone. Uh, that This is the brilliance of Gazelle. You lock in that thing for 30 days. You don't have, If you're like, wait a minute, I haven't decided whether I'm getting a new phone, which phone I'm going to get. But if you know you're going to get one in the next 30 days, you owe it to yourself to go to gazelle.com right now and lock in the offer for your old phone. In fact, even if you're not sure, go ahead and lock it in. It's risk-free, and they don't get more valuable over time. They get less valuable. So go take your old iPhone, your old Android phone, your tablet, whatever it is you want to get rid of uh, that Gazelle takes, and find out what it's worth right now. Lock in that quote for 30 days. And when you're ready to sell, they'll, they'll pay you fast. They let you take your time. But they don't take their time on their end. They'll pay you by cash. Uh, well, they, they won't actually drop cash on you. They'll send you a check or they'll send it to PayPal or they'll give you an Amazon gift certificate if you want. Uh, but they turn it around as soon as they get the product in their hands so you get paid fast. Gazelle.com. Go try it out. Lock in that quote right now. Uh, and uh, it is, I guarantee you, the simplest and easiest way to get cash for your old gadgets. And we thank them for their support of Tech News today. Let's see what's on the calendar. Okay, Mist of Pandaria launches tomorrow, September 25th. Kind of launches tonight. Well, I guess really. you could say that. I mean, but tomorrow. Depending on what tonight. kind of a night owl you are. Right. If you want to stay up till midnight. Then it launches tonight. Yeah. That's right. Also tomorrow, uh, the slim Sony PlayStation 3 250 gigabyte model is coming to North America for $270. And finally, if you're one of those ex mobile me users, remember when Apple was like, hey, move to iCloud and you'll get 20 gigabytes of free iCloud storage for a limited time. And you went, yeah, I'm actually describing myself. Um, that's not a forever thing. Originally, actually, it was a June 30th expiration date on that free storage, which is above and beyond the five gigabytes that they, they gave everybody for free. They extended it to September 30th, but now that's only six days from now. And what's happening is that iCloud users that have more than five gigabytes already synced on their iCloud account. So basically people who need to start paying for more are receiving these, you're gonna, we're gonna downgrade you emails unless you figure out uh, what uh, the right package is for you. Email says, if you don't free up space and come in under the fr uh, five gigabyte free limit or pay for extra storage, apps will no longer back up documents to iCloud. So something to think about if you're one of these people who's really taking advantage of iCloud um, and came from MobileMe, it's time. I had to do that today. I got that email myself. Did actually. you? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Got an email from Saud Paracha, who says, I need to bring this knowledge to you that YouTube has been banned in Pakistan by the government. Uh, what has gone unreported is that since the 17th of September, the ban on YouTube has affected other Google services, which are not working particularly on mobile. For instance, uh, myself and many others cannot log into Google Market or the Google Play Store. Email is not getting updated on the Google app in mobile, but it does work in the mail client from the mobile company. Uh, can you let us know if you've heard any other reports of this and why this would be so? I, I haven't heard any reports of the wider ban. I, had, I have, of course, heard about the, the ban of YouTube in Pakistan because of the ongoing controversy uh, over, the, uh, over that movie. But uh, it could be, the, and, and this has happened in Pakistan before, where they try to ban something and they end up having wider effects uh, I remember there was a, a, a block on YouTube got put in place that accidentally like blocked YouTube for half the internet uh, by, because they changed a, a domain table accidentally. So it, it may be just a, a, a poorly implemented block. I don't know. But thanks for the, uh, the email and the reports out. And anybody else who has uh, comments on that, email us tnt at twit.tv. That's it for this episode. Thanks to all the folks in the subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, who help us figure out what articles we're going to talk about each day. Jonathan Strickland, thank you for joining us. Let folks know uh, where they can find your work at, uh, at How Stuff Works. Sure, yeah. The home base is howstuffworks.com. The podcast I do is called Tech Stuff. Uh, be on the lookout for some big, exciting things coming down the pipeline, which can't really talk about yet, but I'm really, really jazzed about and uh, if you want to follow my shenanigans, you can follow me on Twitter at John Strickland. 
Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. Email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. Our number is 260-TNT-SHOW. Denise Howell from This Week in Law joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then.